All right, welcome back to the podcast. If you're listening on the uh, Apple iTunes, Google Play, wherever you are, uh, you're going to notice some bird sounds in the background. You're going to notice perhaps a sound of cracking leaves, things like that uh, might, uh, you know, who knows, a deer might walk out behind me. Uh, But you really want to check this out on YouTube so you get a a visual of where I am. I'm actually here on our land uh, that we purchased in Maine. My wife and I purchased some land here in Maine. And um, I'm doing a video, as I had mentioned on my last podcast episode, uh, actually doing a video from the property just to share my experience with buying raw land, uh, just buying land, because a lot of folks will ask me about investing in land. Uh, and I had never done it before myself. I had uh, counseled clients on it many times over the years and just used some of those same principles, uh, you know, and the things that I shared and that I've learned over the years. And I, I put those to work as uh, my wife and I researched this property. So if you're not watching on uh, the, uh, if you're not listening to the, if you're listening to the podcast in your car, don't do this now, but uh, definitely uh, go to Craig with a K, Strom on YouTube, you'll find the income engineer and you'll find my channel, Craig with a K, Strom on YouTube. And I'll have a video up. I'm actually sitting in the middle of what will be uh, the clearing for our campsite. So let's talk about, first of all, just raw land in general. Uh, the, the first thing that comes up is why would you be buying raw land? Well, a lot of folks will invest in raw land, for example, for investment purposes specifically, because they feel like if I buy this vacant piece of land, true story, if I buy this vacant piece of land, uh, three acres of land in, uh, you know, Needles, California, or wherever it is, just out in the middle of nowhere, there's not even a freeway off ramp, you know, near there. It's just dirt. It's desert. It's 190 degrees in the summer, that kind of thing. Well, you buy that for an investment because you you know that the that particular town will start to expand out from the city center. And someday you might have yourself a valuable piece of land that the state needs for a freeway off-ramp or uh, that a real estate developer wants to uh, develop. Um, you know, those types of things. And and I have clients uh, exactly in that scenario that, you know, folks bought a, you know, two or three acre piece of dirt out in the desert uh, that's, you know, within 30 minutes of where they live in the city center, you know, in the town center out there in, in the rural California. And they bought it for, you know, let's say 20 or $30,000. They had the money, they just paid cash and they've been sitting on it for years. Well, sure enough, Along comes the state wanting to to expand the freeway and uh, put in an on-ramp. And these folks end up uh, getting a huge payout from the state of California, in that case, uh, for their their parcels of land. They were able to uh, negotiate a very nice sale on raw land that had there not been a freeway expansion, that land would still be, you know, not terribly desirable. Nobody really would be paying any significant uh, increase in value on that property because it truly was just dirt, no water, nothing. So investment is one. Now, what if you are buying land, for example, in a uh, in an area where you're allowed to develop residential properties, maybe townhouses, uh, things like that, where you buy an undeveloped piece of land that has proximity to utilities and things like that, but you're going to have to put in everything. You're going to have to put in the infrastructure, the roads, the you know, all of the sewers and electrical and all that stuff. However, you're going to be able to take a raw piece of land and with the amount, with the the right amount of money, you're going to be able to build houses on it or townhouses on it and sell each one of those townhouses or homes for a substantial profit over just the value of the land itself. So investment for sure. There's a thousand different land acquisition uh, stories of folks who will buy land uh, to develop. You see them all over the place, all over the place. And you see them in your neighborhood, my neighborhood, here in Maine, where I am right now. Uh, remember, on the YouTube channel, Craig with a K, Strom, I'm sitting actually in the middle of my property here in Maine. 
th this could be a residential development site. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, however, let's stay on this investment track. Let's talk about this. If you are buying land for investment purposes, what I'm going to give you right now is I think the single best piece of advice that I can give that I was given, that I've given many times. And I gave it to, um, and I, I've mentioned it on my podcast before, leave your rose-colored glasses at home. You need to be absolutely shrewd, crude, sometimes rude. You need to ask questions that you might think are rude. You need to ask questions of everybody. You need to talk to everybody you can possibly talk to. Uh, you need to know what are the rules behind the property you're buying. Do you have any kind of restrictions? Is there a you know speckled zebra shrew that lives on your tiny piece of desert in the middle of nowhere that prevents you from ever being able to develop the land, right? Is there something that, that causes you a problem? Why is this land so cheap? How long has it been for sale? Has it ever been listed for sale before? Can you still, can you talk to the owner of the land? Can you get any kind of a history behind it? Find out that it's actually covering an old dump. This is a true story uh, where I encouraged a client, dig into it, research it, be careful, don't just dive in. Well, they dug in and they found out that in fact, way back, I mean, in the 20s, 1920s, that land, had actually been used as a dump. And back in the 20s, there was no there was no rules for erosion control and drainage and water runoff. They just threw everything in a big giant hole and covered it up. I mean everything. Oil, oh, you know, there was no electronics, but oil and and um, animal carcasses and just you name it. It's in that hole and then over time they had added uh, topsoil and covered over that property. Now, in that case, in California, with all of our earthquake zoning rules and everything else, you have to you have to excavate a huge amount um, of that earth in order to then develop the property and put down solid foundations and all, all of these things. And that property would have significant challenges where the owner, if that, if my client had purchased the property, would have huge challenges with the environmental permits and the environmental inspections, uh, the soil testing and all of that, uh, that would have uncovered as they went back into the records that, hey, this thing is a landfill. You can't just simply develop this landfill. You're going to have to go through all kinds of reviews and inspections and permit processes and everything else. And that was going to be onerous. It was going to just be too much. So they skipped it. They went and bought another piece of land that was not terribly far away, but it was totally free of any kind of ridiculous encumbrances and such. So you need to, first of all, take off your rose colored glasses. Make sure that you like with real estate, that you're being critical, crude, rude, and asking questions, right? A lot of questions and don't be shy and, and be, be judgy, be pessimistic. Um, those of you watching the video, by the way, you'll see me swatting away mosquitoes, okay? Um, I might even have one land on the camera lens. Uh, that is another thing. When I, talk, when I talk about environment, right, you've got the land, what's underneath that land? Why is that land still vacant? What was that land used for prior to, right, prior to um, you coming along and, and wanting to maybe buy it? Environmentally, what's on that property? Is there anything on that property that could be a problem for you developing? Now, of course, endangered animal species, things like that, you, you know, that's just going to blow up your deal. Even vegetation, is, is there any kind of protected uh, vegetation, shrub brush, whatever it is on that property that could cause you problems where you just want to just get a bushwhacker and start cutting it all down, but whoa, 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 you can't do that. You've got to get permits and permission and things like that. Um, but the critters, right? So there are places like this all over the country, but I'm here in Maine and you could walk into my property in the late fall and just 
be blown away by the colors. Um, the, the space behind me uh, would just be orange and yellow and red and the trees in front of me just spectacular. And it's, it's cool and cold and crisp in the morning and you don't have a lot of mosquitoes around. Not a lot of mosquitoes around in the fall, okay? And in the winter. So a lot of properties in Maine are sold in the early spring, still cold kind of. Uh, and then you might have uh, a lot of properties sold in the late, you know, October-ish, mid-October when the fall weather is spectacular. The mosquitoes are not out. You come here after Memorial Day where I'm here, uh, you know, filming this on my property uh, in um, end of May, 1st of June. Yeah, June 1st. Okay. The mosquitoes are the non-official state bird of Maine and you name it, Louisiana, Tennessee, Kentucky, you know, in the summertime, whew, even in California where I am near a river, you need to know the environment where you're buying your land. Is this a place that if you're going to develop it, and you're going to put houses up, right? You want to sell these properties. Well, now, do you have to constantly, every time you show a property, do you have to be aware of the mosquito population and, and answering that question as you are, um, as you're showing the property? I remember uh, going to tour a property um, that uh, we were interested in buying many years ago, uh, and it was in old cattle country old cattle country and i walked into this uh, this this house and this model home and i noticed that they had on the walls those um uh, purple infrared purple whatever uh bug lights right the bug lights like you might see in restaurants and things like that and i asked the realtor i said so what's going on with all the bug lights oh we're in cattle country there's a lot of flies well and then i started paying attention not a lot of flies. I mean, an epic amount of flies, a lot of flies. So in the summertime, the flies were just biblical. It was amazing. So you have to be aware of these things that you're going to buy a piece of land. What's the environment like? What's the weather like? In this case, mosquitoes. You have to know that I am just all, uh, as we said, all uh, lathered up in bug dope when I was a kid. And so you can wear your appropriate bug spray. You just get used to it. And, and the mosquitoes will leave you alone um, because the bug spray works. And it's worked for, you know, since I was a little kid and it still works to this day. Now, that's a big deal. What's the environment like? Let's go from critters and such to the weather. So in California, the weather, you know, can be extreme. It can be in the, you know, near freezing where we are in California, and then it can be all the way up at, you know, 110 degrees. Um, in the places where I mentioned earlier, um, you can have 115, pushing nearly 120 degrees on some days, right? So the weather is extraordinarily, you know, different depending on where you are, but are you buying a piece of land, right? So here's a great example. Um, uh, we had, had clients who were going to buy a property and they're looking at a piece of real estate and they wanted to actually have it for an investment. Well, that's great. However, um, I, <laughs> I encouraged them to take the rose colored glasses off and ask a bunch of questions, go talk to their neighbors and, you know, ask about the weather, everything. Well, as it turns out, the weather is a big issue that the, in this particular area, this is up in northern, the, the northern Pacific, the rain can be something significant you have to deal with. It's just, that's, the, that's just a fact of life. Well, the, my client asked one of the neighbors, hey, so how's this property do? Any issues that you can think of hearing, you know, about the, uh, you know, with the rain? And, and <laughs> one of the neighbors said, yeah, you should open both doors on your downstairs basement. So there's a sunken basement and there's a, a glass door on one side of the basement and a glass door on the other. And they said, you should open both doors. And he and my client said, why? And he said, well, because when it rains, really heavy rain, it'll flood your basement and you want to be able to let the water out the other side as it floods through your basement. Folks, that's what I'm saying. When I say environment, 
ask those questions. How does the environment affect this property? Okay. All right, let's get into the next thing. This next piece applies to both real estate that you might develop to live in as well as investment real estate. But this is a really important one as well. Ask questions, everybody. I mean, anybody and everybody you can talk to, right? Make sure that you talk to everybody. But ask questions about, has there been any um, development attempted on this property in the past? Has anybody tried to build on this property? Has anybody, uh, are there any black marks uh, in the in the history of this property being for sale? Or uh, has there anybody tried to do something that the town you know, roared up and said, no, um, I'm using that as an example um, because it applies in many different places. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to reference here in small town, rural Maine. Um, this property I'm on had been for sale for a long time. Um, and it, it, uh, it has some issues, right, that you have to deal with that go along with, and I'll, I'll describe that here in just a minute. But someone in the past had inquired about developing this property in small town, rural Maine. Let me give you an example. Across the street from me, there's one house, and they own 10 acres. The house next door is 15 acres. The house next door is, I think, 10 to 20 acres. These are big properties, a few neighbors, they all know each other, and they're extremely protective of this community, the forest, the natural state of being. And this property that I'm sitting on right now, the previous owner had pushed for and inquired about building multi-unit like condos, maybe even apartments on this land, which you can imagine the local population said no. And it really put this property on the radar for all of the town politicians. They're called selectmen here in Maine. Uh, they all know this property because the previous owner had been pushing for development. And, and you're talking again, this is a small property. This is only six acres, 6.75 acres. Uh, seems big for some who might live in California and other places, but it's kind of small. You heard that I, my neighbor across the street is 10 acres and then another one with 15 and then another one with 20. And, you know, the properties are big. And this person that owned the property before me, had I not asked, I wouldn't have found this out. They had been trying to develop they were going to try and jam in like 60, 60 units in here, which, and this property, by the way, just again, a description, this property is lakefront. I, my property is connected to 260 feet of lakefront with a very special lakefront we'll talk about in a minute. But that was a, that was something that had I not asked and found out, I might've been blindsided later with you know, people pushing back on anything that I was asking for on this property. Like I want to put in a camp road and it might've just been arms crossed, like, whoa, camp road, what else are you wanting to do on that road, you know, on that property? And, and had I not known uh, through talking to the neighbors, talking to the selectmen and politicians and people connected to the town, had I not been asking and having conversations, I wouldn't have found out about that. And now, when I start a conversation, I might joke about things, but then I'm very serious and say, I have no plans to build any, you know, any glorious multi-unit anything. This is going to be uh, kept as natural as possible. And I don't want any of my neighbors or any of the folks who are uh, responsible for the permitting process, for example, I don't want them to think that I'm doing anything and I'm not being at all insincere. I want this property to be as natural as you see behind me. It's just an absolute beautiful place to be. And I don't want to spoil it that way. I would never want to put townhouses in here. That's just insane. But if you're not paying attention, right, you might buy a property for investment, like I'm going to build five houses here. And then you find out that the, the town, the city, the county, your neighbors all become your enemy and you, you've got 
trouble from all different sides, that can make it extremely difficult to build, right? That's so, so you may have, you may be able to accomplish the build, but is it going to be worth it in the end? Are you going to get sued? Are there going to be neighbors coming after you as far as you know, trying to cause this project to not happen, right? Um, keep that in mind. Right, whether it's investment or personal. Okay. Now, so that's just again, that's a good beginning as we talk about buying raw land. How to buy raw land? Should you pay cash for raw land? Should you finance raw land? If you plan to hold a piece of land forever, right, 20, 30, 40 years, and you're going to buy it super cheap paying cash for a piece of land that you feel will be worth more someday, paying cash for a piece of land within reason, again, reason being it's specific to you. If paying cash $50,000 for a piece of land is cash flow and cash on hand that you have that is not, uh, doesn't, doesn't hurt you, doesn't change your lifestyle, sure, pay cash for it. If it's land that you are planning to hold for a long period of time, and that land is going to, but you want to develop that land, you might consider using bank financing to finance the land. And, and let me just refresh something that I've mentioned before on my podcast. And it is this idea of return on investment. Okay. So when you buy real estate, whether it's land or whether it is in fact a a piece of property with a house or a townhouse on it or anything like that, you do not make a rate of return on the cash, the equity inside the land. You don't make the land or the real estate. So if you put $100,000 into a piece of land, the only asset, okay, because you had an asset that was cash over here and an asset that is the land over here, and you put that cash into the land. Now you have land. Only the land will appreciate in value, you hope, right? The cash is now standing still. It is now earning a zero rate of return. It has allowed you to acquire that land, which hopefully will appreciate in value, but the cash inside the deal is earning zero. No rate of return when you pay cash for real estate, you earn zero rate of return, there it is, zero, on your cash inside real estate, you earn a rate of return someday in the future when you sell your property, you earn a rate of return on the actual sale of the real estate, you get your cash back out, and the uh, additional increase is the profit on the asset. So when you look at land that you might develop, like my wife and I, we plan to develop this piece of property from raw land into a usable uh, campsite, uh, maybe a home site that someone could develop in the future. Not necessarily for us, but we're going to develop it. We are going to uh, make it more usable. We chose to use bank financing for that so that the bank's money, okay, for an interest rate, yes, there is an interest rate component to it, but we have the bank's money sitting still in this piece of land. Instead of our cash, all of our cash, sitting still in this piece of land. And this was less than $100,000, this piece of land here, which is pretty amazing to get almost six acres, well, to get almost seven acres um, for less than $100,000 on a lake um, in Maine. It's pretty amazing. But we chose to use bank financing with an interest rate expense for sure, okay, instead of putting cash into this piece of real estate and then that cash sitting still for an indefinite period of time. The cash is available for us to continue to make a rate of return on the cash elsewhere with investment rather than tied up in the real estate asset. So I personally prefer to use bank financing for any real estate purchase, okay? Um, that's, again, contradictory to some financial entertainers that I've talked about. Um, and uh, the idea of paying cash for real estate 
It just doesn't make sense. Remember the rules of real estate. Buy it cheap with other people's money in a good market. In a good market. Not necessarily a location. There are some great markets that are not great locations. Okay, So this particular property, we used bank financing so that we could keep our liquid cash working elsewhere and we can work on this property uh, over time. So let's talk about the, the, this property. I've, I've mentioned it now, I'm gonna get there. So this property is a forested piece of woods, you know, that has a, um, a nice paved road. That's a big deal when you're talking about buying land. What's the infrastructure? Is there electricity at the street? Is there any kind of water? Is there any kind of uh, utilities that can be picked up off the street? Uh, in this case, um, quite a ways up the hill. It's, it's a bit of a walk. Uh, there is a pay, nice paved maintained road with power that I could pull power into this property, which we might do, uh, but I could pull power into the property. What's access to your uh, property like? Could you drill a well on your property? How are you going to get water? Do you have to do septic? Can you do a holding tank for, you know, for black water and such, or do you have to do septic? If you have to do a septic system, ooh, you better ask about that, especially if you're buying something in, uh, in the woods, right? That's another reason why you want to know what's the access like to your property, you know, because if you're going to do a septic system, you've got to have a, uh, you've got to have equipment brought in and trucks and all that stuff. And how are they going to get in there? Right? You need to make sure that you have those questions asked and answered. Um, now, this property, again, this used to be uh, uh, a, um, an agricultural um, plot at the, well, this, this property has three different sections that I'll call it three different sections. It is the upland section because this slopes towards the lake and the upland sec section used to be agriculture. Uh, there is a there's a stone wall you can see in the picture over here, and there's one in front of me and behind me. The stone wall continues off into the woods, and the stone walls are generally where the farmers had cleared the field of stones so they could plant uh, you know, crops, whether it be potatoes or whatever they were planting. Now, this, this area in the upland area um, is is ideal for a an initial campsite. So where I'm sitting right now, the idea has been uh, to take down some of these smaller trees and all the little trees, and then put in a erosion control and gravel pad uh, in front of me and behind me. And there'll be a pad where we could park a nice travel camper and and be able to come in here and have a very natural, rustic called a boondocking campsite and just be in the woods, be so cool. And you can hear as I'm talking, birds around us. There is a road up this way, up that way. Uh, that's the, the main road. Uh, and every now and then you can hear a car go by, but there's not a lot of traffic on the road. Um, and every now and then you can hear a mosquito go by your ear. <laughs> as long as you've got your bug spray on, you're fine. But the the property will be able to have a nice uh, a nice pad here for an RV. Now, some of the challenges we had with this property, right? Well, again, I I did a pretty good job of asking all the right questions, haha. But I did I did miss a detail or two, okay? And and that's it's really hard, especially if you're buying someplace like this up in the woods. Um, you know, in some sort of a woodland area, if there's any kind of a river, water, you know, things like that, that adds a whole layer of regulations and, and, and government agencies that might be involved. And sure enough, just on the other side of my stone wall in front of me, there is uh, what the Department of Environmental Protection calls a seasonal stream. <laughs> a seasonal stream, which by the way, has no water in it right now. And the only time it appears to ever have water in it when there's a heavy, heavy rain, and then there's water in it. But you can't really do anything construction wise, camp, road, any of that within 75 feet of a seasonal stream. Ah, I didn't know that. I, that was one of the details that 
The realtors who sold this were pretty detailed on their description. They did mention that there was a protected wetlands on the property and you can't actually build on it or really do anything permanent on a protected wetland. You can't. What you can do is you can put a boardwalk. And I don't know if, if you've ever seen one, but I've seen many of them. The, they're, they're just beautiful. And I love the idea when we saw this property rough. This property is just forest thick. It's, it's, it was a little intimidating and apparently very intimidating for a lot of people who looked at the property because it was for sale for a long time. And a lot of people came and looked at this property and they, some actually got scared that, whoa, this is too much. We can't do this. All oh, the wetlands, the protected wetlands, what are we going to do? We can't do it. And they had no vision of what this property could be. And getting back to that, right, that you've got, that you've got to ask these questions, right? So I've got this protected wetlands and then I've got this seasonal stream. Well, I've got to make sure that I've, I think this through, how are we going to get to the lake? Because if you've got a lakefront property, the value of that property increases tremendously if you can get to the lake and have a boat on said lake, right? The way it is currently, this property does not have access to the lake. So I was able to buy it, my wife and I were able to buy it pretty darn cheap. I mean, very, very cheap compared to what, if this property already had a access to the lake, ah, oh, this property would be three or four times what we paid for it. So I'm looking at it when we first bought it, when we first started looking, I'm looking at it, okay, just like I looked at, you know, rental properties in the past. I like them when they're rough. I like it when they, they're going to need work, right? Because that scares a lot of people away. And that's what happened with this property. A lot of people couldn't see the, the potential. So uh, the potential on this property is just keeps getting better and better. It's okay. So what we are now planning to do and what I've already done is I have cleared from the street. And, and I've done this on working trips where I've come to Maine uh, and I've worked most of the time during the day um, remotely, which is very, very fortunate to be able to do that. And then in the evenings and weekends, I fire up my chainsaw and I come out and take down, you know, all the, the little miscellaneous trees and, and get ready for a camp road because that's the first key, right? So you buy a piece of raw land that has no access to it, really. It's just trees off the side of the road. You buy a piece of raw land, in my case, we did, and now you can clearly see where the driveway and the camp road will be. You can clearly see it, that we're going to come off the camp road, uh, come down off the main road, and you drop right into the property. It'll be a very nice access. It'll be big and wide open, and then it'll come down a camp road that'll meander through the woods a bit, come down here to a place where you can actually drive in with a camper trailer. Uh, that's going to be the beginning. I don't know that my wife and I will be ever interested in building a, um, a structure, a home here or a cabin or anything. We, we're not sure about that. So we'll start by having a beautiful place to be able to just drive in and park a camper in the woods, right? I mean, just the, that'd be just amazing. And then behind me, uh, off to my right, your left, the, the stone wall will have a, a nice little path over the stone wall. And then just on my right, your left, the property starts to change a bit, right? As far as going from more agricultural, and then it's a little thicker, and then it'll be a really nice forested path, a walking path, forested path. Not really driving. I could build a road all the way down to the part where I can't build on. I don't know that we want to do that. So we're going to build a forested path. I'm put that in. And then you get to the forested wetland. That is another piece that, again, these are all things that as you're buying raw land, you've got to ask questions. And I asked a lot of questions of the Department of Environmental Protection. And... I love the representatives that I've met so far. They've been great. 
But so often what you'll find with folks who work for city government, county government, state government, federal government, is they may not necessarily answer or give you any information that you didn't specifically ask for. They, I don't know that they, it's, it's whatever it is, it seems to be a common common gap in communication skills <laughs> for uh, government uh, employees um, that the, the, the seasonal stream was never mentioned. Oh, okay, seasonal stream, thanks for letting me know, that was never mentioned. And they never mentioned, because I didn't ask, I was very concerned about how do I get over the wetlands of special significance. There's a 250 foot boundary that I can't build on, I can go over that 250 feet with a boardwalk, you know, a nice raised boardwalk. It, oh, it's a beautiful walk. I mean, I think it'll be great. Um, but nobody mentioned the forested wetland. They mentioned the wetlands of special significance that's connected to the lake and everything, but nobody, the, the Department of Environmental Protection, the realtor, the city, the town, Nobody mentioned, oh, by the way, there's oh, the forestry service that I consulted. Nobody mentioned that the map also says you've got a forested wetlands that has its own specific set of rules uh, as far as what you can and can't do on the forested wetlands section of the property. Oh, well, that's nice. Um, turns out it's actually very good because, as I mentioned at the beginning, this property has three sections. It has an upland section where I'm at now, and it goes consider it goes down further. But the upland section, the trees are different. The it just the feeling is different. And then you get to the forested wetland section. Wow, it changes dramatically. It's amazing. Then you get to the actual wetlands where you you'd you'd sink up to your waist if you tried to plow your way out to the lake because it's a it's a marshy wetlands area and and it's beautiful i've got two beaver lodges out there it's great but i didn't ask i didn't ask any additional questions are there any other rules and restrictions related to my property that i should be aware of well there's a seasonal stream that you can't put in a road or a pathway near. Oh, wow, that's, <laughs> that's good. And there's a forested wetlands that has a very specific uh, rules that go with that as well, okay? Um, so <laughs> you've got to ask these questions. And um, I'm going to wrap this up by teasing a question that I've asked of a local nonprofit. I asked a local nonprofit whether or not that there was any opportunity perhaps to use a conservation easement on my, in regards to my forested wetlands and my protected wetlands. Is there any way to use a conservation easement? And what the heck is a conservation easement? I'll tell you, there's, there's a, it's a very specific thing that uh, throws up a lot of red flags with some people, but it's been used many, many times, especially up here in Maine. And I'm wondering if that might be a way for me to be able to enhance and develop this property in the way that my wife and I want to, uh, while actually doing something good uh, for the local community and the local environment. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that more as I get details coming along. For now, I want to just wrap it up by saying buying raw land is very often a, a, a very slow uh, process to a, a rate of return. Unless you know something that someone else doesn't, that there's development coming, buying raw land can mean that you're just tying up cash you know, for a long period of time. It could be decades before you ever actually do anything with it. And I have met many people over the years that have had pieces of land that they paid $30,000 for that are worth $15,000 if they're lucky. And the only way that land will ever be worth more is if that freeway, you know, expansion finally comes someday, right? So that they, they have, the land will go up in value. Um, doesn't mean that you shouldn't consider land as a purchase, as an acquisition. Not at all. What I'm saying is that 
I want you to leave your rose-colored glasses at home. Ask lots and lots of questions. Be rude, crude, and inquisitive, right? Really, and I say crude, not rude, but you know, I'm just trying to make the point that you want to ask questions. You want to dig in. You want to lift up the carpet and see, you know, this is a, you know, an old joke here, but you want to lift up the carpet in that house and see if the floor is actually intact underneath it. Are they covering something up, right? I've done that. I got that advice from a real estate investor who said, if you got throw rugs in the living room and they've got hardwood floors, you just say, um, you, you, you don't even ask. I did this once um, where I actually had a, a friend that I was looking at a property with and I just said, hey, grab the other end of that table. We lifted up the coffee table in the living room, moved the coffee table off the rug and, and the realtor was just, what are you doing? I'm just checking the floor. And that's exactly what we did. We, we moved that carpet back. And sure enough, that floor underneath, underneath the carpet was in perfect condition. Perfect. It was great. Uh, but the realtor was surprised that we were actually looking under the carpet. Now, I've heard horror stories of people doing the same thing where they've rolled back that, you know, the big throw rug that's in the living room. And you can see daylight, you know, through the, you know, through the boards right into the basement or whatever. I right? just, you gotta, you've got to leave your rose colored glasses at home and make sure that you're asking a lot of questions, especially if you're buying forested land. Are you allowed to, uh, are you allowed to cut the trees down? Can you have a forest plan, right? If you're buying in like say rural Tennessee or Kentucky, you might be able to buy 40, 50 acres, maybe a hundred acres for a really good price. What's the forestry permitting process? Can you can you get a forestry plan to harvest lumber from your land? My property doesn't have enough uh, large hardwood trees to do a forestry plan, but it, can you do that? Is there a, a, an endangered species, you know, some chinchilla fox that lives on your property that's going to prevent you from developing your property? Is that, is that a thing, right? leave your rose colored glasses at home. I guess that's the theme of, uh, of this, of this particular uh, episode on the podcast. I think I'm going to wrap it up with that. I'm going to take a walk down to the forested wetlands. Uh, I'm leaving actually today. Uh, I'll be back again, of course, but I'm leaving today and uh, it'd be nice to actually take a walk down, take advantage of the fact that I'm all sprayed up with bug spray. Thank you so much for taking the time. If you have specific questions though, about buying land, about real estate, about should I use financing? Should, you know, uh, how do we own this property? And by the way, this property is held in our revocable living trust. If I use this property for an Airbnb type arrangement, it will absolutely be in a limited liability company. But if I don't use this property as a, as a business venture, which I think we probably will. We, we will likely use this as an Airbnb or a hip camp type site. Um, it will be in an LLC, okay? But if you have questions about how to hold your land, should it be an LLC? Should it be an S Corp? What, what are you doing with your property, financing your property, living trust, wills, all of those things, feel free to send me an email, Craig with a K, at craigstrom.com. Craig with a K at craigstrom.com. Thank you so much for listening. Please share this. If you know anybody who's interested in buying land or real estate, maybe this will be helpful for them as they think about buying land, uh, especially out in the woods. In, okay. Uh, so I'm going to go take a nice nature walk. Hey, like this video, share this video, give it a big thumbs up. Same with the podcast. Leave a great review. Only five stars. Take care. Bye for now. <clears throat> Information presented is for educational purposes only and is not intended for solicitation, sale or purchase of any security or financial product. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and your tax professional before implementing any strategy discussed here. The term personal pension refers to a marketing name designed to educate future retirees and retirees about the economic principles behind creating their own pension like income. The term personal pension is not intended to be confused with a defined benefit pension plan offered by an employer or by a government entity.